My name is Alex Abdo. I'm the litigation director at the Knight First Amendment Institute. Uh, delighted to have so many people in the room and to have uh, uh, this wonderful panel to moderate. We're going to pick up the conversation uh, that began last night and um, was continued you know, just a few minutes ago at the last panel with a slightly different inflection. Um, the, the conversation we're hoping to have is one about whether anti-monopoly tools could helpfully be deployed to remedy uh, free speech disorders online of the sort that uh, were cataloged uh, very nicely during last night's panel. And we want to move beyond the sort of headline debate over whether we ought to break up the tech companies to the more granular question of whether there are concrete interventions that would solve uh, or remedy specific pathologies that people have focused on in online discourse. And uh, Lena Khan on last night's panel and uh, again on the panel this morning uh, gave an excellent taxonomy of the various approaches that might uh, that we might consider as part of the anti-monopoly toolkit, uh, ranging from rules re uh, requiring common carriage or neutrality in certain services offered online, rules requiring interoperability or interconnections uh, uh, of the various services offered online, uh, rules prohibiting certain kinds of conduct or business models uh, that are prevalent now uh, in online discourse, or rules imposing other various affirmative obligations, uh, for example, disclosure requirements or others that might uh, flow from considering uh, these platforms to be essential facilities. And we have four uh, wonderful panelists to help discuss uh, these possibilities and that overarching question today. Three um, uh, essays uh, by these panelists and one contributor. Oh, that, that's, that reminds me of what I was supposed to tell you. So uh, <laughs> some people have been asking about the papers. Um, I, you got an email uh, shortly after registering for the event that has a Dropbox link to the papers, but we're going to send out that email again. And so look in your email inboxes for a Dropbox link to, uh, to drafts of the papers. And the authors are still working on these, and they're going to um, continue to work on them after, after uh, today's symposium uh, and have final drafts for publication, I think, uh, over the next uh, few months. Uh, but you'll, the draft should be in your, in your inboxes soon again. Um, so let me just introduce our panel and then we'll just jump right into the conversation. So I guess I'll start down at the far left. We have Ellen Goodman, who's a law professor uh, at Rutgers Law School and the co-director and co-founder of the Rutgers Institute for Information Policy and Law. Uh, next to her, we have Surya Matu, who's an investigative data journalist at a new media organization called The Markup. He was previously at Gizmodo and ProPublica and uh, Data and Society and, yes, the MIT Media Lab. Um, next to him, we have uh, Evelyn Duick, who is a doctoral candidate at Harvard Law School, whose uh, research and writing focuses on uh, the topics we'll be covering today. And finally, next to me, we have Neil Chilson, who is the Senior Research Fellow for Technology and Innovation at the Charles Koch Institute. So I'm going to start with, um, with Evelyn. So Evelyn, your essay argues that anti-monopoly tools may not be up to the task of fixing uh, the pathologies that we see today in the speech environment. And in fact, that there may be real benefits to having large platforms that can both throw a lot of money at these problems and also collaborate with other platforms to solve uh, commonly defined and understood problems. Um, so can you spend maybe five minutes walking us through through that argument. Sure. Uh, thanks, Alex. And uh, um, I will say, when, when Katie uh, gave a brief synopsis of my argument last night, the next words were, and Mark Zuckerberg agrees with this argument, which is exactly the place you want to be in conferences <laughs> like this. This goes down really well. So, um, so my, my paper has uh, two goals. And if I only achieve the first one, um, I'll, I'll be happy with that. My first goal uh, is to sound a warning alarm about something that is already happening and not a lot of attention is being paid to it. Um, so collaboration between platforms to tackle a number of online speech issues that are not core to their business model uh, is already occurring, and there's a lot of pressure for it to expand, uh, and we need to be paying attention to this. So uh, this trend has its origins in a very small, confined collaboration around child sexual abuse material. Um, there's a centrally housed database of images, and platforms use shared technology to match uploads to their platforms against this database uh, and identify criminal material. Um, and even in this very limited area, originally there were real, real concerns about this kind of centralized censorship model. Um, but the, the sort of conversation that happened around it is uh, this is a really confined and quite identifiable and definable area uh, of content, uh, and it's never legitimate. Uh, 
Um, you don't want to see this material in the context of news reporting or uh, in the context of raising awareness around it or counter speech. Uh, it's just never something that you want to see or be distributed. Uh, and so it's okay in that context to have this centralized model. Um, but then it started to spread. Uh, the next area we see it is in around terrorist content. Uh, and it's uh, at the same uh, exact model. Um, it's, uh, th there's a, a, a forum called the Global uh, Internet Forum for Countering Terrorism, um, where there's a centralized database and the platforms use similar technology uh, to prevent uh, images that get added to the database uh, from being uploaded to their platforms. And again, we see the same early concerns about this centralized uh, censorship model, uh, and now we have a much uh, more real concern about how hard it is to define the category of content that we're concerned about. Um, and Daniel Citron uh, has, has memorably called this evolution censorship creep, where you have a tool that's used in one context and it starts to spread to other contexts. And what I'm talking about is a cartel creep, where you have this collaboration in one context and it starts to spread to other contexts. Uh, Original concerns about it, uh, there's been a marked turnaround. This GIF-CT database, as it's called, is now a flagship uh, thing that the, the platforms hold up as a real success story around look at what we're doing um, to, to, to meet this threat. Um, and now we're starting to see conversations uh, specifically invoking the success of these two previous models uh, spreading to other areas, saying, well, why don't we have something similar around uh, coordinated inauthentic behavior or what we might call election interference, um, a similar conversation around deep fakes, uh, and sort of just more generally. So if I only achieve the goal of going, wow, that sounds scary, um, can we have a conversation about it? I'll be very happy. But the second goal of my paper is to examine why this is occurring and whether it can ever be beneficial and how we might redeem these arrangements to serve the public interest. Um, and so the reason why it's uh, occurring is that for some of these concerns, cooperation really might be the most effective way of countering uh, the threats. Um, take foreign election interference, for example, which are often very highly sophisticated cross-platform operations, and if you're working together, that's the most effective way of actually detecting what's occurring. Uh, also, some of the technology that it is necessary to identify these, uh, this kind of content can be very expensive and it might be only the large platforms that have the ability to develop the necessary technology and so the question is do we deprive small platforms from having, platforms from having access to it? Um, and then um, this, this might be especially true where if as the major platforms take more and more action about this, uh, against this kind of content, content, it just moves to the smaller platforms uh, who are less capable of dealing with it. And so what do we do in that case? So some people will hop off the train in the second part of my argument and, you know, in some areas I'm probably pretty prepared to join them on the platform. Um, but I do think we need to have a lot more, a, a, big, a bigger conversation about, uh, about this and trying to identify when and how this might actually be a useful, uh, a useful model and, and help us uh, preserve healthy public discourse. That's great. So let me ask you one question before trying to bring everyone else into the conversation. Uh, so you're, you're right. You identify, in a way, the benefit of concentrated power. And you know, um, your response is, as you said, redemption, potentially, to look for ways to redeem that concentration rather than to, say, overthrow it. And I suppose that, for you, turns on some assessment of the benefits to uh, uh, you know, not cartel-like behavior, but open and accountable collaboration mm -hmm. um, as weighed against the, you know, the risks of allowing the, the concentrated entities to continue to exist. And so I want to probe on that a little bit, what you think the real upsides are of this collaboration. So you identify a couple areas where, um, at, at least one and maybe more areas in, uh, in which there may be relatively uncontested norms internationally that we would want platforms to apply to certain kinds of speech. We can all agree that child sexual abuse uh, material um, uh, you know, it, it, uh, should be treated as contraband. Um, but as soon as you get beyond some of these narrowly defined categories, you quickly get into deeply contested questions of um, what sort of speech should remain online. And so, this is maybe a two-part question. Um, how uh, many categories of uh, speech disorder do you think we want uh, collaborated and constant, you know, uh, concentrations of power to address? Um, and then even setting aside their ability to address whatever categories of, of bad speech we may 
be able to define in some uncontested way. Um, should we, shouldn't we still worry about the fact that one individual effectively controls what two billion people here on the platform, um, uh, and that's a, an independent problem that we ought to weigh against the benefits that you're pointing to? Um, so, uh, yes, I, I, I'm very concerned about monopoly power over public discourse, which is why uh, I'm very happy to be here today. Um, but uh, my concern is that if that's your, if that's your worry, um, we risk recreating that risk in another form about cartels, um, and whether, depending on what we do with competition policy. And so that's why, uh, no matter what we do here, I think we need more transparency, accountability, oversight, civil society input into these arrangements. And I do think that uh, to, to an independent checks on the calls that they're making to ensure that we don't have this one person making a call for, for what two billion people see. Uh, in terms of the areas of content in which this, um, this could work, uh, it's something I'm still really struggling with. Um, but I do think it, it, it can be potentially true that uh, it, it, it is in more circumstances than just, you know, child sexual abuse material. So, for example, um, you might take, like, the Christchurch video, for example, which went viral uh, across many, many platforms, and I think there would be a lot of agreement that that's the kind of thing that most people don't want to see uh, on, on platforms, and if there's a model for helping smaller platforms who suddenly find themselves hosting this material and don't want it, um, able to, to tackle that, uh, maybe that's a, a good thing. Um, I also want to say that I think there's an assumption in some of the conversation around this when I, when I talk to people about it that collaboration will necessarily end up being more censorious than non-collaboration. And I don't think that's necessarily true um, because if the technology is, uh, is, is good, if we can develop technology that's um, m more nuanced and less of a blunt tool, uh, that might actually be uh, more useful for smaller platforms who otherwise might have to take a blunt tool. So just really quickly, a story about Marius from Poland who hosts a platform called Just Paste It. Um, it's a very simple uh, social media platform. You put some text in it, it gives you a URL that you can share. Um, Marius from Poland suddenly found himself hosting a lot of ISIS material, uh, particularly as the la larger platforms started cracking down. He's one guy running a very simple social media platform. He doesn't speak Arabic. And so the solution that he's thinking about is well, maybe I just don't allow Arabic content on my uh, platform at all. And the, the, instead, the solution that comes up is, well, he can join the GIFCT uh, consortium and he can use that to identify terrorist content more uh, with a more nuance um, than just removing that language entirely. Um, but, and, and, and tech talks about this as a success story. I think in part it is, but I'm also still worried about the lack of accountability and transparency around this database. So maybe we can redeem it to make it uh, more useful. And so I'm going to violate my own rule that I just said and ask one more question, so, but, but a quick one. So um, maybe you argue maybe collaboration won't be more censorious. Will it necessarily be more um, uniform in the set of rules that are applied? It, it seems as though you're, you're leaning into having one set of norms that a, a, a applies internationally rather than, say, the sort of plurality that the last panel was celebrating. Yeah, um, I mean, I, th I think that's right. I think I have to own that. Um, and, in, and in some areas, I think what we're saying is that yes, we do want more homogeneity and, and better enforcement of some rules and norms on social media. I think that's the conversation we're having in the last uh, couple of years, that we want stronger gatekeepers in some areas. The work that we need to do now is identifying what are those areas. Great. So, um, Neil, let me bring you into the conversation. So, as I mentioned a minute ago, you know, a very small handful of companies have outsized control over what people are exposed to uh, on the platforms that they're increasingly turning to for news and information. And uh, you work at the Charles Koch Institute, which is a libertarian organization. And historically, one concern of libertarians has been centralized control over uh, the instruments of liberty. Um, your paper argues, though, that uh, uh, we shouldn't be as concerned as maybe we are about concentrated control over public discourse, or in any event, uh, that anti-monopoly tools or antitrust tools aren't the right ones to address whatever problems people are pointing to. So why don't you walk us through that argument? Uh, sure. Um, I'm not sure I, in the five minutes I can you know, get through a history of the important differences between public and private power um, and summarize my paper. So let me come back to the, the public-private distinction uh, if, if we have time uh, in a second. Um, but our paper makes three key arguments. Uh, first that these concerns about platforms and free expression on them isn't really caused by competition. Um, and I, I make this argument, but uh, both 
Evelyn and Genevieve, uh, Genevieve uh, Lakir both make this argument actually quite a bit better than I do. Um, and so uh, you should read their papers, uh, and I won't dive into it too much uh, on that. The second one is that these concerns don't rise to the level of antitrust violations under current antitrust law. Um, Although it's possible that with more work and better economic understanding, some of these could be identified as consumer welfare harms that, that do. And third, the, and I think this is the, the core, maybe controversial piece of the paper and the one I want the most feedback from all of you on, is that if antitrust law were changed to address some of these concerns, uh, to reach such concerns, um, that such changes would actually threaten free expression rather than protect it. So first, uh, you know, these speech issues aren't really competition issues. Um, they're not caused by a lack of competition. And I think uh, there's been a sort of overlearning of the lesson of economics that competition drives uh, companies to provide what consumers want. And so now sometimes people look out into the world and they see that consumers aren't getting exactly what they want and they immediately think, well, this must be a market failure or this must be a failure of competition somehow. Um, the truth is competition incentivizes companies, but it doesn't guarantee that consumers get exactly what they want because consumers never get exactly what they want. Um, I might want you know, zero calorie ice cream that's free. Um, it's not a lack of competition that means I don't get that, right? Uh, uh, there can be lots of other things that cause that. And so we can't immediately look at the fact that consumers aren't satisfied and, um, and say that there must be market power that's happening and that that's, uh, it's anti-competitive. In fact, in the area of content moderation, which is the speech problem that we mostly focus on in our paper, um, the issues around bias and, uh, and hate speech, um, you have actually diametrically opposed sets of consumers. Uh, you have, and I'm really overgeneralizing here, uh, you have, uh, you know, the, the, on the right, you hear people complaining about their content being taken down too much, and on the left, you hear people complaining about the fact that people on the right's content isn't taken down enough. Uh, so that's a big generalization, but, but what that suggests is that if we're seeing a bunch of unhappy people around content moderation in this space, it might be that consumers just really, really disagree about how this stuff should work uh, and what, what they want their platforms to look like. Um, and I, I know we'll get into this a little bit about the, the you know, maybe the multiplicity of platforms is, is the solution, but the simple uh, metaphor I would use is that this would be like trying to develop a, um, a, a soda product that satisfies both uh, die-hard Coke users and die-hard Pepsi users. You can't do it because they just want different things. And so that might be part of the explanation here. Um, so, uh, you know, on to the next one. Uh, you know, the question is whether or not existing antitrust law could support a case in this context. And the popular complaints right now are framed as monopoly cases, um, but mon market power is not uh, itself illegal under current antitrust law. Uh, and if you earn it, if you gain it by serving consumers better, um, it's actually uh, okay under U.S. competition law. And so current antitrust law requires that you define a market, that you show there's market power in it, and then you have to show that that power was gained or maintained through some sort of ex exclusionary conduct. And I think um, whether you like uh, the content moderation approaches that are being taken right now, it's really hard to fit them into the definition of exclusionary conduct uh, that traditional antitrust uh, deals with, uh, especially since the current law largely focuses on whether or not consumers are, are better off. This is a consumer welfare standard that you've heard mentioned already. Um, and here in content moderation, you have some sets of consumers that are benefited by any particular decision or practice, and you have other consumers who aren't. So that, that calculation is quite difficult. Um, so, and this is the third argument, uh, if the current antitrust doesn't work well, some have suggested changing antitrust law um, and I, we're concerned that changing antitrust law wouldn't only, not only not solve the problem, because the problem isn't really a lack of competition, uh, but it actually itself would be a threat to free expression. Um, calls to change antitrust are often framed as uh, to go back to the Brandeisian roots of antitrust. Uh, but the antitrust of the past was actually quite a mess. It was very, it included a lot of different factors. Uh, it included a lot of different, uh, the statutes are very vague and uh, unclear, and they're so broad uh, that they could justify pretty much any action the government wanted to bring. And I think Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart in 1906, 1996 uh, stated it quite well when he said that the only consistency that he could find in antitrust law was that the government always won. Um, that's not the kind of legal tool that you want protecting free speech. 
Uh, and indeed, because antitrust is a powerful tool, it has been abused uh, a lot. And I'll just run down a list of presidents and things that they did badly with antitrust in the past. So uh, Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt, known as the great trust buster, he only busted some trusts. He kept around the trusts that he thought uh, were malleable to the government's uh, desires. President Johnson stopped an antitrust case against a bank uh, because the owner agreed to use the Houston Chronicle, which the owner uh, owned, uh, to support Johnson's uh, as a presidency. Nixon uh, used the threat of antitrust to coerce ABC, NBC, and CBS, talking about a concentrated market, um, to provide better coverage. He also did a bunch of other nefarious things that I think uh, um, John Samples and Paul Matsko, their paper talks about at length, and they'll probably talk about it later today. And more recently, we've seen President Trump uh, threaten as a candidate to block the AT&T Time Warner uh, uh, merger because of CNN's coverage of him. And then his administration did bring a case uh, against that mer to stop that merger. Um, but the DOJ lost that case because, unlike in Potter Stewart's time, uh, the government doesn't always win under our current approach. And so, uh, you know, antitrust has evolved. And you can talk about whether or not that, that is a problem, and I think there are concerns there. Um, but turning back to an, a more ambiguous, a more vague era where antitrust was more of a raw political tool would mean that people would be free to use it for political reasons, uh, including to suppress speech. And so even if you think uh, less constrained antitrust is useful for other purposes, um, I think you have to think about whether or not it's the right tool uh, to use in the free speech context. Uh, I, this is not to say big, big tech companies are powerful. Uh, they have a lot of practices. Uh, antitrust scrutiny should be applied to those practices. Um, I, I'm all in favor of that. Uh, I'm just concerned that uh, we need to use the right tools to address these, these issues. You don't, you don't use a stick of dynamite to pound a nail into the wall, and you don't brush your teeth with a backhoe. I don't think you should use antitrust uh, to, to protect people from bias and censorship online. So, so let me, let, let's move to some of those slightly more granular questions of you know, alternative policies that might address, say, uh, problems that we could define in content neutral ways. So moving you beyond antitrust and beyond questions of how you improve content moderation online. Wh what about some of the competition solutions that have been discussed over the past, uh, you know, in the last panel and, and, and last night that are again designed not to um, uh, influence what some might characterize as poor or poorly implemented content moderation policies of the tech companies, but that are designed to introduce heterogeneity uh, into the speech environment, uh, or to introduce competition over, you know, kind of speech adjacent, um, uh, the speech adja adjacent features of social media, uh, like privacy or the ad business model, um, uh, or more generally, just uh, address content neutral problems that people see on, on, on social media. What, what do you think of, of those proposals? Um, do those answer your concern about um, uh, turning antitrust into a malleable standard that is used to moderate speech on the basis of its content. Um, and I, I think this goes in part to a point that you made in your paper where you said, would-be reformers need to define what they think of as a good speech environment, or uh, sorry, as good speech, what good speech online looks like. And one answer that I think those reformers might give to you is um, that they're actually not trying to uh, create a particular speech environment, they just want competition over the speech environment um, so that we have a plurality uh, of speakers, a plurality of listeners, and maybe not just one company that decides what people are hearing. So how would you answer those, those questions? Uh, great questions. I, I think uh, this kind of goes to the, the question that I skipped out over a little bit, which is this plurality question. Um, well, if consumers want different things, like they want different diet, they, they want different, uh, they want Coke and some want Pepsi, why aren't there just two companies that, that do different things? And part of the challenge here is around, uh, like all things, consumers have other desires as well. And so um, while, while uh, Coke and Pepsi, you can choose one without really losing much, if that's your preference, um, on, on social networks, you want to be the place where the most people can hear you often. Uh, or you want to be in the place sometimes even where people don't agree with you. And so you're not looking for a, a space that's, that's friendly. Um, I, I know a lot of people who seem to spend a lot of time arguing on Twitter, and I'm, I'm sometimes guilty of that as well. So, uh, so the, the, this issue of network effects means that people want to be on the biggest platforms. Even, even if they might retreat to a different type of platform, I don't think these pressures on the big platforms are going to go away just because we have more platforms. Whoever's the biggest in these network effect models, they're competing for the market. 
And what that suggests to me is that they will try to develop moderation principles that do look somewhat homogenous if their goal is to compete for the entire market uh, because they're going to try to appeal to the most, uh, the most customers. And having said that, uh, we are seeing differences. I mean, we're seeing differences in uh, what types of political ads the platforms will, will or will not run. Um, and so I think we're still, it's still evolving a little bit there. Um, and and the, other, the only other thing I would add about the plurality is that um, while, while the reformers often aren't trying to control, they aren't trying to do a specific uh, you know, viewpoint-based regulation or they don't want to get a certain uh, viewpoint-based regulation, the question is not what would the good people do with these sets of tools. The question is what would the people that you don't agree with do with this set of tools uh, and who might really want to use those tools to, uh, to create a, an environment in which only the type of speech, is, speech that they like uh, is around. So that, that's my response. So, so, so just one, one quick follow-up then on that. So does your cons doesn't that suggest that the target of reformers ought to be the winner-take-all nature of the platforms? Um, you do point, it's true that people have preferences and they express those preferences in a different way. There seems to be a sense in which um, uh, you know, we're not in a market where there's Coke and Pepsi. We're in a market, well, maybe there's just Coke and Pepsi, but there's not, um, it's actually hard to name, I was thinking about this a minute ago, it's hard to name another soda that's not owned by one of those two. <laughs> I was going to say Mr. Pibb or Dr. Pepper, but I think those are all owned by those, by PepsiCo or... Mm -hmm. You gotta get, you gotta get yeah. into beer, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. People, you know, people want a, a Brooklyn lager. Um, so, so it does not suggest we ought to be focusing on the winner-take-all nature of these by developing solutions that would, you know, take that on. Um, Things like interoperability that we discussed in the last platform, where you would retain the benefits of scale, retain the, uh, you know, the sense in which you can be on the platform that, uh, a platform that allows you to communicate with friends of yours uh, on that platform or ones that interoperate with that platform, um, but that nonetheless introduce competition over, uh, uh, over the market so that consumers can express more fine-grained preferences rather than just, do I want Facebook or do I want uh, Twitter or Google? Uh, Sure. I mean, I think that's an interesting approach, and it does avoid some of the problems with uh, antitrust approaches that would change antitrust. And one of the things, the side effects of antitrust that I didn't really point out is that while you're focusing on the tech industry, antitrust applies across all industries. So if you change that sort of metric for, for tech, um, it's going to have ripple effects across the economy. Um, and a, a more focused approach wouldn't necessarily do that. Um, uh, tools like interoperability, I think, um, Again, I think they could be very useful, and they are, they are very useful now. I mean, there are, there are uh, tools that people are developing to make things more interoperable. And I was particularly um, interested uh, by uh, the comments last night around uh, adversarial interoperability. Um, that's the sort of emergent process that's very interesting to me. I'm, I'm, I'm much more skeptical of top-down imposed uh, interoperability, or even the sort of cartel-formed uh, uh, interoperability, except in maybe some specific areas, because I do think that those, t when you're having central decision makers, you're not solving that problem by having, shifting the central decision makers from, uh, from a set of corporations necessarily to, um, to uh, government, and maybe this, that would be a good place for me to talk about that public-private distinction if you want, but... Well, let's hold off on that. Let's hold, there, there's a lot to talk about, but let's, I want to I bring Ellen into the conversation, too. So, Ellen, your piece argues that competition alone um, is not going to solve what you see as the main problem on uh, so the social media platforms, which is that they're built to promote uh, the viral spread of low-fidelity information, as you call it, uh, and that they're also built to disable our ability as consumers to resist the allure of that virality. Um, and instead, you, you argue that we need to meet the problem where it exists, which is at the system level design of, of these platforms, um, and introduce friction uh, into them so that we can once again uh, exercise what you call cognitive autonomy. So can you, can you walk us through that argument? Yeah. And so I want to say at the beginning, I'm all for more competition. And I think basically we just wouldn't need to care that much about what Facebook does if Facebook weren't so big. So I want to put that out first. Um, second of all, just um, to pick up on what Neil said, and this has been mentioned before, but since I'm going to talk about regulation, I do want to say that um, a deregulated world is not a neutral world. So it's true that regulatory tools can be abused, and we're going to hear, I think, in the next panel about how the FCC has abused the public interest standard. Um, but it's not as if not having any regulation is not itself um, putting a thumb on the scale and favoring certain actors. 
Um, so I want to pick up um, on the theme of this morning that we have faced analogous moments of uh, media anxiety. Um, and at the same time, there are some very new things about our environment uh, today. Um, and it's not surprising that in this moment, the sort of regulatory moves we're seeing coming out of Europe, um, some of the states have enacted these laws and we see some proposals at the federal level. It's not a surprise that the first wave of these is looking at transparency. Um, and that's because, you know, transparency is sort of a light lift from a free expression standpoint and it can be um, content neutral. What my paper argues is that these first efforts to adopt analog transparency rules for digital media uh, are inadequate given how digital information um, flows work. And so we can't be satisfied with these. Um, moreover, for transparency to be meaningful, <laughs> we're going to need new sources of friction uh, in, the sen in a sense to support healthy communications and um, uh, sort of human cognition. So the transparency rules that I'm talking about that are being extended into digital, they arose um, in the 20th century during periods of flagging trust in media where concerns ran high about manipulation. So these were after the payola scandals and after Watergate. Um, and they were designed as content neutral interventions to give people more information. This is essentially out of you know, liberal commitments to free speech and a belief in cognitive autonomy. Um, if people have more information about who's speaking to them, they will be able to sift signal from noise and have better information fidelity. Um, and so the first wave of these regulations um, have identified you know, this digital loophole that a lot of these rules just didn't, don't apply in the digital world. Um, FEC rules, FCC rules about sponsorship disclosure, um, and so they would apply these disclosure rules to the digital context. And then there are some new disclosure um, rules that are being considered or have been proposed, like for bots or for deep fakes. And I think the problem with this approach is that these are analog solutions to digital problems. Um, and, and one of the ways this is so is that they attach to messages. So the classic example would be, you know, a TV ad that opposes fracking controls and the disclosure would be brought to you by Chevron. Um, so this approach assumes certain features of the communications environment um, that, that are more characteristic of the analog world than the digital. Um, information was relatively slow flowing. Um, I think, you know, things that Susan McGregor talked about and that Emily Bell have talked about, about, you know, demarcations between um, editorial and sponsored material cues about the credibility of information. Uh, just a more bumpy and, um, uh, you know, to topographically distinct um, set of, uh, uh, of, of information um, flows. Moreover, um, mass communication was coarse in its targeting and therefore its manipulative ability, what was called, um, what is called the spray and pray technique of advertising. Uh, and then relative systemic transparency about who messages were reaching um, and how they were selected. Not perfect transparency, but um, relative transparency. So in the digital world, all of that's different. Um, we've heard a lot about that. Um, so if the regulator's goal is to increase information fidelity, uh, it's unlikely that merely trans transplanting um, disclosures at the message <coughs> level is going to do it. Rather, we need more systemic <coughs> visibility into the circulation <coughs> and amplification of speech, um, especially around micro-targeting of messages. Uh, to particular people based on their digital dossiers about how algorithms amplify certain kinds of messages um, because it's here that the meaning of communications resides as much as in the particular message that we end up seeing. So for, you know, to use my example, um, let's say that, that a particular Chevron message is generated for me based on my behaviors and my interests and knowing that I'm Jewish, maybe it says that the anti-fracking campaign is headed by an anti-Semite. Um, but for other people, the ad would, would activate other triggers. So to really assess this message, I would need to know not only who is speaking, but why I'm being targeted um, and who else is being reached. Uh, so in the paper, I argue for disclosures about reach, not only about speech. Um, but I conclude that um, I don't think even these are going to do it, um, are really going to address the kind of information infidelity that we're, we're concerned about. Um, and, uh, you know, some of what we <laughs> might think about is, you know, reintroducing friction 
um, into our communications flows. So the frictionlessness of our digital world um, is great in that it reduces barriers to entry, um, but it also removes some of the felicitous side effects of friction. And so Emily talked about how you know the, the inefficient advertising market supported journalism, and there are some other things we could talk about. Um, and if we have time, I'll, I'll throw out um, you know some suggestions. I mean, I think they've already really been um, raised. I mean, I think that Evan's idea of taxation is a form of friction um, uh, that would not only raise revenue for a certain application, but would also maybe um, uh, um, put some drag on the use of micro-targeting. Another um, approach would be simply to limit um, how micro-targeting is used, and I think that was mentioned last night. Um, so that you would have contextual rather than behavioral targeting. How far would that go to solving the problems that you're identifying? Um, so really targeting the, it seems as though a lot of the problems you identify in your paper are traceable, at least in part, to the business model, um, to the, de the demand it creates for surveillance, um, what Ethan was calling a surveillant business model. Um, and uh, uh, which feeds into a system that degrades autonomy in the selection of information that we're reading or the understanding of the context of information that we're reading. So h how, much, how, how far would that go in your estimation to, to solving those problems? Um, and if not all the way, maybe you can talk about some more of the forms of friction we might introduce at the level of the user's interaction with, um, with the platform. Because some, the, some of these forms of friction are friction on the system, but maybe not the sort of friction that reintroduces or, or um, you know, empowers individuals to make the autonomous decisions that you want. Taxes, for example, right? Taxes um, uh, will allow you to, you know, fund Ethan's dream project um, and engage in all, or, you know, other sorts of <coughs> civic giving. But they're not going to affect me when I'm looking at the platform, at least not directly, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so, I mean, so my proposal is really embedded or assumes um, sort of two different systems which we'd also have to work on, right? So one is if we have competition. So I'm assuming a world really in which, this paper doesn't say this, but I'll, t I'll tell you the secret Step now. one, assume solution. I'm, <laughs> I'm assuming a world in which there are other options, and either whether it's through antitrust or through interoperability, um, but there are other options, and so therefore transparency has some meaning. Disclosures have some meaning because we can take um, our attention elsewhere. Um, the other system, you know, obviously, you know, we didn't really have time to talk about is that those sort of analog world, uh, that analog world of disclosure was nested in a whole sort of civic architecture of media literacy and development of sort of capability for self-governance and all of that. And so, you know, for that friction to be meaningful, one would also have to be thinking about how um, these communications tools are situated in a larger, you know, socio-political uh, um, income inequality and civic education and all of the sort of soft skills to make use of, of w the friction or the transparency. Right, right. Okay. So, um, Suri, let me, let me pull you into the conversation, and then we'll have a, a slightly more open conversation, I suppose. Um, so y you have been kind of at the front line of diagnosing. So, you know, Ethan on the last panel said, um, he, um, we haven't even scratched the surface of what the problem is. Or maybe we've started to dig, but we need to dig, I think, his phrase was enormously deeper. Uh, um, and you're on the front line of that digging. You have, you know, you have the shovel in hand and you spend uh, day in, day out working to understand the effects that technology has on society. So what, you know, if we're trying to uh, describe the problem, how do you describe it? And does it suggest particular solutions? So I think from, from my perspective, uh, coming as a journalist, not having a paper, so I'm just going to kind of talk more ad hoc. I apologize if I don't always sound coherent. I'll do my best. But basically, I think what I've learned from the work I've done as an investigative journalist is that technology companies and the technology they create, um, all the technology they create imbues the values of the culture is created in. That's fundamentally kind of something I have learned through this process. So what that means to me is, the concrete example, when I was at Gizmodo working with Kashmir Hill, we did an investigation into Facebook's people you may know algorithm. Now, this is the algorithm they use to suggest friends to people. As far as Facebook is concerned, the, that, that friend suggestions that they're making to me, that's not even my data. There's no API, there's no way for me to collect that information. We had anecdotal information about who that algorithm harms, <laughs> um, and basically a lot of psychiatrists came up to Cash and said, hey, you know, it's really weird, my patients are constantly getting suggested to me and I don't know why, and this is like, really problematic for me on a variety of different levels. So we started investigating the system. Look, I, I built some tools for us to collect this data, and what we found was that 
a variety of different communities, including sex workers and LGBTQ folk, were getting severely affected by this algorithm because they had no way to know why people were being suggested to them. And often sexual harassers were coming up in the suggestions. People who they wanted no kind of no communication with were being suggested to them and outed to them on this platform in a way that they had no control over. When we wrote about this and went and told Facebook, they said, oh yeah, all you have to do is go to your settings and say that no one can suggest friends to me and then you'll be fine, no one will be able to do this. But we, the story came out in 2017 and that feature only exists for public figures. Not everyone has access to that feature. And even today, that feature is still up there. There are FTC complaints where people have gone and said, hey, Facebook, you need to give me a way to opt out of this. I still need to use Facebook for a variety of reasons, but it's causing me these kinds of problems and I don't know why. So basically, that's a kind of an anecdote of where, where my head's at from this. So the framework I use when we do these investigations is what we call like adversarial research, where I'm trying to really understand how, I don't really care so much about how algorithmic systems work, I care, about more, care more about who they harm. And where this kind of plays to uh, the values of a tech company is, I don't think they went with the people you may know algorithm, for example, I don't think they were trying to actively harm communities um, like the LGBTQ community and sex workers. I think they just weren't in the room when the algorithms were being made. These systems work at distributed scale beyond the scope that four people in a room building a, I, I'm an engineer, I know how you build these systems. And when I used to work in the healthcare industry, it was quite well known that when you introduce new technologies into the world, it'll solve some problems and create new ones. But somehow with distributed networks and distributed platforms, we seem to have forgotten that and we haven't embedded into the technology ways to audit that. So that's fundamentally kind of my, my mm -hmm. posture and why I'm always like digging because like the, I really think of my job as like being like the like a like a health inspector for a restaurant, right? I'm looking for the cockroaches. I'm like I know like it's it's that level of digging. It's not some like kind of high level philosophical argument. It's like I just, I'm just looking for the concrete ways in which these things are causing people problems. So, so how do we make your job easier? Uh, it, it, it's, well, one fundamental yeah. thing is like the, kind of to Ethan's point is like make like have the company say that hey, as a journalist, you're allowed to collect data from our platforms. Right, like I, that's all I really want. To just say that, hey, I am a journalist, and let me build automated tools to collect data from your platform. What do you do now? In the absence of that, what do you do now? Uh, very elaborate workarounds. <laughs> <laughs> right, so like I'll have a way in which like there'll be a browser running on my screen, and I'll be like watching it, and it'll be scrolling on its own, but. It'll be on my, comp like I'm, I constantly trying to find ways in which it doesn't come across as automated data collect. Like you know, it's an arbitrary term and the problem I have with it is the people who decide what is illegal or legal is the companies because it's their terms of service. I just want a third body to say, hey, I found evidence that this is causing problems. Why do they get to tell me that I can or can't do this? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, so I wanna, I wanna throw something that you said um, at Evelyn. So. Um, so Surya pointed to this idea that technology is imbued with the value of the culture in which it's created. And um, when I hear uh, you kind of leaning into the idea of collaborative enforcement of you know, you know, uh, universally determined norms, it makes me wonder this question. You know, does that homogenize the set of values that um, are being implemented in a way that underserves communities of you know, traditionally underserved communities, communities of color, um, uh, women, or, you know, in a, in a global sense, just countries that don't have the same, um, you know, will inevitably have less input when it comes to these collaborative um, institutions that you're envisioning. Do you worry about that? Every day. Um, so, like, that, that list of uh, concerns is pretty much precisely my list of concerns with the GIF-CD uh, database. And I think we need to do some work uh, to remedy that. I guess um, the, the way I would think about it is uh, maybe we can use these, uh, these institutions and these systems to set a floor around certain things that we uh, really do, uh, are getting to the point where we want some standards and, and things around and then um, to, uh, to the, the platforms can moderate on, on top of that. Um, the, the concern that I have as well is that we are moving to a place where we are, like governments are setting flaws uh, in certain areas and that that might actually in fact create a competition problem. So if you do have uh, things like governments passing laws around extremist content, remove it within an hour or you get fined or um, you know, hate speech and things like that, um, 
the large companies are going to be able to comply with that um, or take the fees, uh, the fines when, when, they, when they come up. Uh, it's the small companies that, that aren't going to be able to comply with that. So I, I do definitely take your, your point and, and, and this concern. I think that's why we need accountability, transparency. I want to audit those algorithms. I, I don't want to do it. I want Surya <laughs> to audit those algorithms uh, for us. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think at some point um, that, that, might, that might be the way forward in, in practice. Great. Okay, go for it. Uh, yeah, that, that point actually uh, made me think of a point when Ellen was was talking about friction. Um, my first, you know, I, I'm an engineer too, and my first thought was like, big objects can overcome friction much easier than small objects. So creating friction actually could exacerbate uh, a competition problem if you think there is one, uh, and wherever that friction is. Um, one of the other possibilities might be, uh, we talked earlier, and I think we'll hear a lot more on later panels, that current media companies, the traditional media companies, they actually have quite a lot of friction. And you're pointing to that as a positive. But is it possible that there, some of their competition issues right now are a, a result of that friction, and that by finding ones that um, are unnecessary? I think someone earlier mentioned the, uh, the media ownership rules, which you know prevent broadcast companies from buying newspapers, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of, they're very complicated, actually, and uh, in certain markets, et cetera. And um, maybe those types of friction, uh, maybe there's unnecessary types of friction, ones that you might not even find positive. So I was wondering if, if, there's, if there are those types of friction in the, uh, the current media environment that by reducing, you might bring them more on a level playing field. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a different kind of, um, of friction. And I think that there's always the argument that, um, I, you know, bigger is better. Um, and I think that, and I, this is, you know, the, this is my problem with the cartels, is that I just think that there are ways that we can, um, through open standard setting organizations, there are ways to sort of get scale without having um, concentration. Um, the... Um, uh, and, and on the ownership, you know, companies have always tried to defeat ownership limits by saying if only we were bigger, we would do more good stuff. Um, and that's never been proven out. I want to raise, a, just sort of throw out there kind of, um, this is sparked by Surya's comments, um, kind of a notion of heterogeneity um, or plurality that we haven't really talked about, which is uh, heterogeneity in the law. Um, and so, you know, if you talk about one thing, and I think um, President Bollinger either said this or his Tanner lectures say this, um, we've been very resistant in American law to defining journalists or journalism or giving it any kind of texture or um, content. And, um, and I think what Surya is saying, like if we were to have, you know, an exemption for the CF in the CFAA for journalists or, you know, if Facebook were to actually privilege a certain kind of um, journalism, which it says it can't do because it doesn't want to define it, and in saying that it's leaning on American legal traditions, which have also not defined it, I think that day is over. And I think we really do need to define, be willing to define what journalism is and give journalism some privileges. I, I, you know, I should say that just if you want to know how Facebook would react to this proposal, the Knight Institute proposed that Facebook implement a safe harbor for journalism and research, not journalists and researchers, but journalism and research as a function. And we came up with a kind of proof of concept of how you might define these things. Um, and you know, a year and change later, to nobody's surprise, they've more or less rejected this proposal. Um, but so our panel was tasked with um, addressing some you know, concrete proposals. And um, you know, two of the concrete proposals that we discussed, I kind of want to just get more of the panelists' reactions to. Um, and I want to start with yours, Ellen. So s systemic transparency, the idea that we um, need more information to understand the problem, potentially to empower regulators, potentially to serve consumers. Um, I, I would want to get everyone's reaction to this. To, to, you know, to what extent do they think this would address uh, the disorders that they see online? Um, and also, how do we accomplish this? Can we accomplish this um, with, uh, you know, current regulatory tools and First Amendment understandings? Um, and as you, as you, yeah. Uh, no one's ever not in favor of transparency, right? Um, Dave I, I, Posen is. Yeah, well, <laughs> true. Um, uh, okay, so uh, yes, definitely in favor in of, of more transparency because um, you know we were just discussing this before. Uh, th these conversations are really, really great. We can identify a lot of problems, but we don't actually really understand 
what those problems are and, and how they're working. And we have so many problems uh, to work through in this space, and a lot of them are intention as well. Um, and so we have to be making some like educated decisions about the trade-offs between uh, addressing some of these solutions, and we just can't do that without uh, better data around um, what's going on. So yeah. So. Uh Drawing on my uh, years at the Federal Trade Commission, I would say that one of the uh, one other benefit of transparency is that um, it's a set of it's often framed as a set of promises that a company makes to consumers. Um, these aren't usually are not enforceable under contract law, but uh, but a lot of the FTC's privacy work has been focused on and data security work has been focused on holding companies to those promises when they break them, and so. Um, I haven't thought this through all the way, but I guess there is some potential that if companies make promises about how they moderate content and then uh, and then fail to live up to those promises, that that is the sort of thing that uh, the FTC could look at as a consumer protection violation. So, one thing that um, that came up to me when we were, everyone was talking was that the the definition of a consumer here is confusing to me because on these platforms we have producers and consumers. And I think uh, in the a traditional rhetoric of what a consumer is and what agency a consumer has, if you're not buying anything, what is the consumer's agency in this context? Because I can't choose between Pepsi and Coke because I'm not paying for either, right? It's kind of what the social network and the scale affect. That's what like defines which platform I use. So I'm kind of curious how that plays. Does that question make sense? Yeah, I might. I mean, I, I was using that loosely because uh, we're talking in the antitrust context, which often talks about consumers, but uh, I guess user would be just as uh, useful for me for most of the, the stuff that I was uh, talking about. Uh, it's an interesting point that you you can't choose between Pepsi or Coke because you, uh, in this context because you're not paying for it, but um, you can by not, by, by not using the platforms or using different ones. But that um, disadvantages but you in a variety of different ways that we see and that tends to skew against people from minority sure. background, blah, blah, blah. Sure. All of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and those and making those trade-offs uh, are what consumers face all the time. I mean, obviously, high prices disadvantage uh, certain groups over others. Uh, so, having platforms that weren't free would would disadvantage uh, some groups over others. And uh, and so, the question is, how do we make sure that the, those decisions uh, that consumers are able to use the platforms, uh, they're able to make those choices um, in a way that that um, the question is, who's going to make those choices for the consumer? And actually, a lot of the conversation, uh, is it going to be the consumer? Is it going to be somebody building uh, the system? Is it going to be a government regulator? And what are the trade-offs between those different systems for making decisions for consumers? For, or users, sorry. I should say users. <laughs> So I, I also want to invite any feedback that people have for Evelyn's idea, for Evelyn's idea that we should potentially lean into collaborations among the companies as a potential avenue of solving at least some of the speech, uh, speech pathologies we're seeing online. I have one thought on that, which is to me, concentration is a symptom, not a cause of a bigger problem. Where if you're getting into a framework where we need to have a centralized system, it's actually kind of antithetical to the distributed network that the internet is, and it's always going to be problematic how it gets enforced. Because the way these systems work are so distributed and kind of personalized, you will in eventually have the problem of homogeneity. Who gets to choose what goes inside that centralized silo? I think it serves, I, d I think it does help and I think it's important, but I think it's also like um, a flag of, oh, if we get into a place where we need that sort of centralized system, something bigger is not working. That's just kind of my instinct towards it. And that actually, a great example of that uh, was uh, that Ethan brought up earlier. Uh, TV in the 60s, which was a vast wasteland of basically boring stuff, more or less. Uh, and a, a part of that was because of there was a centralized system, a quite heavily regulated system around broadcasting as, uh, and that helped create the, uh, the environment in which you had a few central voices uh, and that homogeneity emerged from that because they were all trying to appeal to not to a niche consumer but to everybody. And so that had benefits but had some drawbacks as well. Certainly drawbacks in representation uh, in content. I mean, I guess I just have a question. I mean, I, I get the argument that, um, you know, this child pornography and the terrorism content <coughs> and the hashing and the database is all difficult and it works better when they collaborate. Um, but I guess my question is to what extent is that a matter of 
you know, t technical feasibility and to what is extent is it just a matter of incentives and that if we, um, I mean, we could think of a lot of different ways of incentivizing these platforms to deal better with these issues and I, and if we did, um, would a decentralized, could, could, could they manage it in a decentralized manner? Um, so, I mean, I think, I think that argument probably has a lot of force with uh, major platforms, um, but I, I do really worry about like the, the less, uh, the, the, the smaller platforms that just don't have the resources to, to devote to building the technology to deal with this uh, in, in an effective way. Um, and also in, in the situations where uh, like um, coordinated inauthentic behavior where it, because the threat and the issue is cross-platform, um, the, the, the cross-platform collaboration is one of the only most effective ways of, of meeting that threat. So, um, you know, I, I, I do take that argument, um, you know, very seriously, but I, I, ju I do think that there are just like, um, there, there is some force to the, to, the, to the point that collaboration might be the best tool for, for, for dealing with some of these. Issues. How do you make a collaborated, uh, a, a, you know, a collaborative system like that accountable to um, uh, a community? So, you know, t take that the example that you were just focused on, um, where every company may have a very different definition of coordinated inauthentic activity. Um, to some people, that could describe a well-run political campaign. Mm -hmm. um, to, to others, it could describe foreign interference in an election, um, and when those you know, definitions are contested, and as you point out in your paper, what we're seeing right now, the, the cartel-like behavior we're seeing right now is that one company passes off another's judgment as its own, uh, or, or points to another as, an escape, you know, as, a, as a defense of its own conduct and says, well, Facebook did it, so we're kind of in the same bucket and we'll all you know, live or die together on, on this policy decision which sounds like an unaccountable system. It sounds like one in which it's very difficult to hold individual account uh, uh, actors accountable. So h how do you ensure that there is a, you know, feedback, you know, p political feedback in that system? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the problem we have with individual platforms too, though, as well. Like, how do we ensure that the decisions that they're making, um, these big platforms individually, are also accountable to a community? So, um, you know, I, I think that... Uh, if we could answer that question, maybe the second question of how do we answer it, um, it when they're working together might be simpler. Um, but, you know, I think um, the, the, the solutions part of my paper is definitely the shortest. I ran into a <laughs> word limit and I was like, oh, no, uh, what a shame. And, and blew past it, I should yeah. say. <laughs> um, so I, I will say that. But, you know, like um, I, I want... Uh, outside independent voices at the table, which is just not happening at the moment. Like civil society doesn't have a seat at the table in, in GIFCT. Uh, this is the terrorism database. Sorry, I used it before without uh, explaining. Um, I, they are talking, there are now, they're, they're, they're making it an independent organization. So we'll see what that looks like um, in the next sort of, well, we don't have a timeline, but soon. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, sort of like that uh, and, and auditing, some sort of like mandated uh, auditing. And I will note that it's, um, it is governments often that are pushing for this as well. And so what I want to see is as they're pushing for it, as they're pushing for cl platforms to work together more for in the space of terrorism or coordinated inauthentic behavior, I want them to be also pushing for these transparency and accountability mandates at the same time. Just uh, in the case of a separate example of where I think like the transparency is so important and so problematic that we don't have it is um, Facebook's video metrics measurements where they basically miss, they just, the, the way they defined how long someone was watching a video was different to how they thought it was and it basically took down industries in the news platform where people were pivoting to video because they thought there was more user engagement on those fronts, but it just turned out they were counting wrong or counting differently to how we thought and that just instantly changed a variety of different organizations. Resource structures, the way they were hiring people, who they were letting go of, and it really had a big impact on journalism. So I think one of the reasons you need transparency isn't just because of ulterior motives, but as someone who, has, who writes code every day, I know how many bugs my code has. And I think anyone who writes code knows that. So the fact that we don't have a way that we can just put our hands up and say, hey, there's going to be problems in this, but we're going to try. What do you guys think? And having kind of an open way to discuss that is inherently problematic. All right, so this, there's a lot to respond to, but I want to open it up to the, to the audience. So why don't we start with someone who hasn't asked a question yet. Let's start over here. I think this was a, my name's Toby Butterfield. I'm from Moses and Singer here in New York, despite my English accent. 
Um, I think this has been a really great conversation, and I want to ask the panelists what they think of this idea. I feel like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act has a whole bunch of procedural safeguards in it that are designed to filter out infringement, things like standard technical measures which are required for the uh, platform to qualify for uh, uh, the um, safe harbor, uh, bl red flag knowledge that trips potential like additional liability, um, uh, repeat offender p policies. I feel like those sorts of mechanisms could easily be applied to moderation or to uh, the sorts of offenders that you're talking about. What do you think of that? Um, you know, I think um, the DMCA has worked really well if you're a copyright owner, but hasn't hasn't worked so well in terms of um, freedom of expression. And so it's, it's a cautionary tale in that sense. I mean, I do think it's kind of a cartel. This is the cartel at work, right? Yeah. Um, so maybe, Evelyn, maybe you want to... No, I, and um, d definitely, and there's a... a it's not like my, my key area of, of focus, but there's a big conversation happening around this in Europe at the moment um, with the new copyright directive that's been passed where they're having exactly this conversation where, um, you know, there's going to be a, 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 a filter li uh, requirement, basically. And, um, you know, YouTube spent some ridiculous amount of money developing content ID, its, uh, its technology to be doing this kind of the flagging and, and catching. Uh, and and the, so the, the question is, what are these smaller platforms going to do uh, to comply with this requirement? And as far as I understand it, we don't have an answer to that yet, but it's, it's, it is pointing up exactly the same issues as we have uh, in the... Well, it also highlights one of the difficulties, right? That, that regime, to the extent it works, um, and there are, you know, there are significant uh, criticisms of the regime, but to the extent that it works, it relies on a fairly objective understanding of what the copyright holder's right is in, right? Um, you can say, this is the piece of work that I created, not some other piece of work. And even that's contested and doesn't account for fair use, and there are problems with all of that, but at least you have, and so maybe that's a good model for something like the child sexual abuse um, material that Evelyn was referring to earlier, but as soon as you move outside of that, then you start to get to these questions of, you know, contested legality and contested norms. I, if I may follow up, I guess my point is that if it turns out that there's somebody who repeatedly uploads infringing material, then they fall afoul of the repeat offender uh, policies. Whereas there are it, Section 230 and people who are spreading misinformation or libelous information or child pornography, I'm not exactly sure how they get filtered out by the platforms. But, but in, in terms of distributing lies or uh, coordinated uh, inauthentic activity, isn't that a mechanism that could be use, useful? I don't know, just an, just an idea. Well, I, so because we're at a First Amendment event, uh, I think uh, restricting the ability to distribute lies on a platform would be <laughs> uh, somewhat challenging under a First Amendment uh, uh, regime in the US. And um, I'm definitely not the most expert person in this room on the First Amendment, but that's that right there lights a bunch of issues for me. And I think the DCMA had some early issues on, on that uh, front as well. So. Well, I mean, mandating it would be, but I mean, I think uh, platforms do take similar kinds of action themselves, um, and you know, coordinated and authentic behavior accounts get taken down. And if you breach uh, like harassment uh, rules, or you have a number of flags, and uh, and um, your permissions are restricted. So, I mean, I think uh, that's somewhere where experiment is happening. That that kind of thing is happening. Hi, my name is Ellery. Um, a question for Evelyn. Coordinated inauthentic behavior. Do you th think you, like have you seen examples of the platforms doing that where you think they've really done a good job at taking stuff down and you can check it? Like, like somebody can independently kind of say, yeah. No, and that's why, okay. I, so to be clear, Content cartel was not intended to be a complimentary phrase. <laughs> uh, I don't think that these things are good, and I'm very concerned about, uh, the, like, all we know is that the platforms are talking to each other about this stuff, 
and then stuff comes down and we have varying degrees of, degrees of disclosure around that. Um, so for example, take some coordinated inauthentic behavior from China in Hong Kong uh, a little a couple of weeks ago or so. There was a big takedown across three platforms. Uh, Twitter was the most open and released a data set around that. And sure enough, as journalists were digging into it, uh, there was some collateral damage in, in that data set and people who shouldn't have been caught were being taken down, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Facebook does not release the, the data, but gives some examples. And I mean, yeah, they look problematic, but like that doesn't really tell us very much. And then Google, a little while later, like, is like, yes, based on the information from two other platforms, we have also taken stuff down. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, no, I 100% agree that it's a very problematic standard. I think um, th th there's a lot of pressure on platforms to be doing something in this space uh, ar around this material, so uh, it's, it's around this activity. So um, I think that we definitely need more accountability and transparency around what that standard even means. I am uh, Michael Myers, New York Civil Rights Coalition again. I hate this, con this discussion. Everything I hear from every panel so far is censorious censorship, censorship. Where does free speech come in? How do we protect the freedom of speech against the hate speech monitor? We need hate speech in America because we hate a lot of things, not just Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola. We hate ideas. And we need platforms where we can hate the ideas that we engage in society. Why can't we have a, a Knight First Amendment Institute that is promoting the idea of various voices, more voices, and against the notion of censorship and banishing, quote unquote, hate speech? There's no such thing as hate speech in a free speech society. Does anyone want to? Add to Ethan's response, I think, from the last panel. <laughs> uh, okay. I, I think yeah. I would just add that this is actually similar to the plurality question that you were talking about. And it's also related to a question that uh, you circulated earlier, but we didn't really talk about, which was uh, whether or not these platforms have been a positive for, uh, you know, are, are we having, are there more voices? I think our, in our paper, we argue that uh, it's easier than ever to have a global, to have a global platform to talk on. Um, that your voice can be can reach people that you never met and never will meet, um, and the question is whether or not the the structures that are on those platforms are somehow limiting uh, what we're hearing, and maybe there's some concerns there. Um, my my big picture view is uh, that you know if you look at the percentage of content, you know Facebook deals with what it's like 10 billion pieces of content a day. If you look at the percentage that have any sort of moderation touching on it. Um, it's a very, 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 very small fraction. And so these platforms in general have been big magnifiers of people who previously could not speak. And that, uh, as we've talked about this entire time, <laughs> uh, has a lot of benefits. It has a lot of uh, problems as well. I just clarify that, I mean, I think almost every piece of content on these platforms has moderation of some sort. Like, it, it doesn't, a very small fraction gets censored or taken down, um, but I mean, the, the way in which you, the moment you open Facebook, everything you see is moderated in some sense, in the sense that you know, your news feed is curated for you uh, in a certain way. So in other words, there's, not a, there's no sense of neutral on these platforms. Absolutely. It's one right. form of moderation exactly. or another. Yeah, and I just Even if you just did a time priority, that wouldn't be neutral either, so. Yeah, I mean, I, just, I also think transparency kind of supports your point, because I think if we're gonna hear hate speech, I want to know what skin you have in the game, who you're saying it to, who you are, um, and we don't know that on platforms. Yeah, and just to last to add to that, like the listening is really important and gets left behind on these platforms. In the back over there, yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Kyle. Um, I'm a grad student researching international disinformation campaigns. Um, and my question is mostly for Evelyn, although it's something that Ellen touched on, which is, it seems like you're conflating a little bit the centralized power uh, and scale of these technology companies with their ability to actually collaborate and build tools that effectively solve these problems. And I guess I'm curious, like, and maybe I'm misrepresenting your argument, but that seems to be the sense I'm getting. Pure financial considerations aside, what is actually, um, why, why is it that 
concentrated companies are better equipped to solve problems that could, for example, be solved by the open source community? Um, so, I mean, I think that it, I, I think it's just a matter of, um, in some of these, so let's take coordinated and authentic uh, behavior campaigns. Um, a lot of these actors are in, uh, increasingly sophisticated and uh, a adversarial, um, and a lot of the uh, content moderation technology that's being used, um, I, I understand, is uh, you know, increasingly um, is very expensive to produce. So, I mean, whether I, I don't, I, I think the open source community, uh, you know, I, that would be great. I'd love to see a lot of initiative and and work around that. Um, I think that that could be a, an an excellent um, solution. But I think then th that you know that's um, that's where you r run into things like uh, needing uh, interoperability mandates and and things like that. I just don't see it. Uh, like that's not the current situation, I guess. Is the, uh, I, I, I'm very much in favor of your proposed alternative. Uh, it's just not on the table right now. Uh, that that's one example. I guess the question is more: What is it about these platforms, particularly given their adverse financial incentives, that makes? Is there anything specific that gives them an advantage in solving these problems um, that the rest that everyone else does not have? Well, I, yeah, I think resources. Um, I, 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 data. They're the only and ones data. with the data. <laughs> like, I think that when you're training an algorithm to detect certain types of content, the more, I mean, I'm I'm not an engineer, but uh, the, the more training data that you have to feed into that uh, system, the, the better you're going to get. Um, so, for example, let's take uh, the Christchurch shooting. One of the problems that Facebook said in uh, detecting that material uh, was that it doesn't have a lot of training data of first-person shootings, um, which is uh, thankfully a, a good thing. Um, but then what Facebook's doing now is it's sending a bunch of uh, cameras into police uh, to police forces uh, around the world with cameras um, so that they can get more of that kind of footage and then train an algorithm on detecting that kind of footage. That's just not the kind of thing that uh, lots of, A, it seems uh, redundant uh, to create a lot of redundancies to require every platform to do that kind of thing. But B, it's just not the kind of thing that, that a lot of platforms are going to be able to do. Time for a couple more over here. Aviv. Hi, I'm Aviv Ovadia, uh, Thoughtful Technology Project. Um, and um, I wanted to first just point out two quick things. Um, Ellen mentioned the um, idea of like defining journalism and using that as some, having, giving that some sort of, um, having had have that have some sort of impact on what, let's say, Facebook does. And I want to just point out that JTI, the Journalism Trust Initiative, um, uh, is being organized to basically do that and it essentially create a standards body around what is journalism. And I think that's an interesting initiative that has got a lot of international buy-in. Um, uh, and then just also around what, um, like, what is the, the, the thing that these platforms provide um, that, other, that everyone else doesn't have? Well, it's not just data, and I remember, the, the, I forgot the other thing was their resources. resources. Yeah, it's, it's also power, right? Like, if you're, a, um, if you're in Myanmar um, and you're the, the, a local, little local platform or open source journalist, um, you're in a power, you have a power relationship that you have versus what Facebook has and being able to say, oh yeah, you generals, we're gonna take you down, very, very different. Um, that, to my question, what about WhatsApp? And we're talking here about public discourse. WhatsApp isn't public discourse, right? It's end-to-end -end encrypted chat. Um, but actually, you have groups of 256 people and you've got hundreds of them or thousands or millions and networks of them specifically created in order to spread political messaging. That sounds like public discourse to me. And I really wonder how that fits into this whole world. Well, I just want to, so it was really the WhatsApp example that got me thinking about friction, right? Because they voluntarily decided to, um, to limit those message forwarding. I mean, you know, and then this gets back, could that be a rule? Um, probably not under fir current First Amendment doctrine. Um, do we need to rethink how the First Amendment, which is the next panel, I guess, um, or the last panel, um, you know, and I think I think we need to be sort of courageous in thinking about wh what is possible. But that's an I think that was a, a sort of productive use of friction. And I just add to that that I think like, as, as someone who's tried to collect data on WhatsApp and see how this stuff works, 
there are people, that there are signals on the ground, right? Like people who live in different communities. Like this is where the diversity conversation and plurality, plura plurality is really important because I think there are people who have concrete examples of the way these things hurt them or hurt their communities and the ways in which I see this happen in India all the time with the way misinformation is being spread and the way how strategically and at scale that stuff's happening. And people on the ground can give you concrete examples of what that looks like and what that me those mechanisms are. But there's no way back to put that back into like the mothership and there's no way to see if it comes back down. That feedback loop is completely obfuscated. And if you had more transparency around the piping around this, it would help. I don't think it would solve it, but it would slow down how um, these things solve. Like you could slow down how um, it would have been quite easy a couple of years ago to know that just being able to add someone, send someone a WhatsApp message if you have their phone number is something that's problematic. Like, like that's something that could have been that could have come up earlier. Um, yeah, I, I just think uh, WhatsApp is a great example of um, some of the trade-offs that I was saying earlier that we have the decisions that we have to make here around, like for example, that, I mean the most obvious one is encryption versus uh, like some sort of moderation. Um, so that really throws up that issue. It also I absolutely highlights the the benefits of uh, the idea of friction. Um, I, I do worry sometimes about, uh, I mean, the market isn't going to solve the friction problem because it's always friction for thee and, and not for me. Um, like, I, I, whenever I have a slightly slow internet connection, I want to kill someone, so. Um, <laughs> but, um, so, it, it, so it's something that maybe we need to think about uh, more systemically. I do sometimes worry that that's going to be regressive um, in the sense that the people who uh, have resources and power are going to find other ways to work around friction, um, and the the people who uh, you know really sometimes are vulnerable and need and and really benefit from easy and simple connection um, are going to be the hardest hit by examples of friction. And so I, that is something that I think we need to think about when we're designing uh, a a good friction. But I I also think the other thing about uh, WhatsApp is it is it shows that um, you know it some of these problems aren't platform problems, maybe they're society problems. And um, we, some of them, some of the time, I think we're, we're blaming platforms for things that um, maybe we need to look at uh, solutions in, in other areas because uh, it's, it's not necessarily the business model that's driving some of the problems with WhatsApp. Alan, can I, can I ask you a question? So uh, some of the conversation has seemed to assume that the friction you're talking about, I think, is a literal sort of friction, you know, affecting speed. And I took your argument to be in your paper that you really want a kind of cognitive friction. Uh, you you want to uh, slow down the rate at which people um, process information in their heads. You know, th this kind of maybe apocryphal example of switching from a sans serif font to a serif font mm -hmm. to improve readability or, or, or at least reading comprehension. I took you to be proposing measures like that, you know, that Facebook get away from Arial if that's what they're using and use Georgia instead. Um, but but other th you know, context clues or other sorts of things that introduce cognitive friction into the social media experience. Is that, is that what you have in mind, or what are other examples that you have in mind? I mean, to be fair, I, to be honest, I haven't worked it all out. It was, it's like sort of a notion that I ran out of, I ran out of space, <laughs> too, at the end. Um, um, so I think that um, micro-targeting, for example. So if you make micro-targeting harder, um, that is going to, uh, that, that's a source of friction in the business model. Um, you know, if you, if you, you know, other things I was thinking about was if we're looking for regulatory analogies, what do we do in securities markets, right? We have a tripwire when things, um, uh, when the price drops too low and there's sources of concern. So if really what we're talking about is virality, like we don't care that much it's bad when there's, when there's um, circulation of sort of antisocial messages, um, but we don't really care about it until it goes viral and it causes harm. So at that point, maybe there would be a tripwire and then there would be a source of friction that would stop it. The, the WhatsApp is another example. So I think there are many, many kinds, of, um, not only cognitive, but also in the physical world. And just to add like a concrete example of where that would be really useful, there's oftentimes when we as journalists go to companies and we talk to their PR people and they give us an answer about why something works the way it does, and it turn, turns out the engineers changed it in the time that between when they when they last spoke to the PR people, this the PR people spoke to us. Mm -hmm. So like having friction even there to to think about like is the PR person inadvertently lying <laughs> because the systems are changing so fast? Like there should be a moment for pause there. Having to test it with the communities of interest is also a source of friction, <laughs> right? Yeah. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Over here. Uh, could, could we back up on the conversation? You, you mind just turning your mic on? Yeah. 
I'm going to shout, though. Um, just to pick up on the earlier conversation about you know, whether we want uh, whether there's an argument for consolidation because only the super big giants can like you know do the do compliance basically, um, is there reason to think that that's meaningfully true in a when it comes to tech platforms in a way that's not when it comes to like auto safety or drug manufacturing or all these other industries where we don't think you know we really ought to just have two companies because otherwise it would just be too hard. Is it like are, are the things that we're discussing today really different in some crucial way? So the idea being maybe maybe Chevy would be better at developing better tires if it had if it were the only car sale you know car company in town and collected all the data on right yeah airbags you know, right yeah, seatbelts sure. why there's so many car manufacturers like. G gosh, only. So, Evelyn, why are you so beholden to a concentrated social well, so media environment? But, but I, think the the, <laughs> I think the equivalent is we're saying, okay, well, small car manufacturers can send cars out without airbags. Like, that's kind of um, maybe the, the situation because they. Or, or you have a consumer protection agency. Yeah, or, or yeah. Um, okay. Or, or standards, right? Right. And I, I think. Um, Sorry? Uh, no. Which we do in the car, in the car context. Right. Yes. right, exactly. Um, so, I mean. Or product liability, right? And and uh, like I, I think I'm in favor of, of of that. I just think we need to think about the competitive. Oh, sorry, I am in favor of of a lot of that. I think we need to think about the competitive uh, effects of that, and if um, if those standards are are going to have anti-competitive effects because they're going to create barriers of entry, barriers to entry for small platforms, um, then I think that maybe this is a, a solution to that kind of problem. Just what, can I just, like, on that exact point, I, like, I, I think that we should imagine a world where there are, where right now when we think small platforms, they're really small, right? Because Facebook and Google are blotting out the sun. And so just like when we think about what it would mean to be a smaller platform, we would have to think about it in a universe where like small didn't mean microscopic relative to the big ones. Well, we have, you know, Pinterest, there's lots of other, uh, there's lots of ones that are sort of in that medium space that have lots of users. Most of them are multi-homed from the other platforms as well. And so, uh, so I think we live in that universe. Yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of small, when I say small, I mean like small to medium. Like, so the example I talk about in my paper is Discord, which is not uh, tiny and is now suddenly uh, having a, a white nationalist problem um, and it's it's looking for solutions. So, uh, you know, I, I do think that there there is, um, there is a, a, obviously a spectrum, but I will say I think I'm very glad to have achieved at least the first goal uh, of my my paper, which is, there seems to be a lot of concern about this uh, it, this this solution and a lot of conversation and thinking about it. So that's good at least. Uh, on that note, like, join me in thanking the panel, and I think well, the lunch I think is upstairs in the Drapkin Lounge. So there's a staircase I think just out that direction, head up and go to the left, um, and we'll reconvene here at two fifteen. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.